this is Fiona, one of the co-hosts of the DM's Book Club, a weekly book club podcast where we read about some Dungeons & Dragons and discuss how we might include it in our role-playing campaigns. In this episode, I interviewed Beth the Bard, a professional dungeon master and the best-selling D&D author of She is the Ancient, a gender-bent Curse of Strahd. She is the Ancient is a reference guide to the NPCs of the Curse of Strahd campaign book, with descriptions, connections and suggestions for roleplay, as well as proposed story changes and alternate encounters. Whilst marketed as a gender-bent Curse of Strahd, She is the Ancient is a bit more than that. There are alternatives for the problematic horror depictions, as well as the elimination of racial slurs and ableist language from the original module. Perhaps you'd like to see more women represented, more than just desired objects or hags. Perhaps you'd like to play a classic Dracula story with less targeted sexual violence. We can all have tabletop RPG horror without the repeated use of prominent real-life horror. As Casual Campbell states, vampires should understand consent better than any monster. They literally have to ask for permission to enter a home. If you're a big fan of Curse of Strahd and the Ravenloft setting, I highly recommend checking this supplement out. Curse of Strahd is one of the most played modules for D&D, so I really think it's worth your time. She is the Ancient recently hit platinum bestseller on DM's Guild, and Beth is currently working on updates for a second edition, as well as getting the book ready for print in hardcover. You can find all the links to Beth's work and her upcoming projects on her website. That's BethTheBard.com. You can also follow her on Twitter at It's Beth the Bard. Thanks again for listening. Stay safe and see you on the flip side. Let's just start with a very simple question. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you and what do you do? Hi, I am Beth the Bard. I run D&D games professionally, mostly for teenagers, but I'm going to branch out more into running for adults because I recently picked up a couple adult groups and wow, that's a different experience. <laughs> um, not necessarily better, but very different. different. I'm like, that the different is kind of fun. I'm going to, I'm going to dig into that a little more. Um, cool. I also write TTRPG content for different companies as well as my own self-published work. Mm-hmm. I think that's, uh, I am also a mom <laughs> and <laughs> I like movies. I don't know. I don't know what else I do. You have a good sense of humor and like walks on the beach, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> oh, I hate the beach. Ugh. Oh, perfect. Great. <laughs> how did you get started in RPGs and how did you get started into DMing then? So yeah, I got into TTRPGs. I've, I only recently started playing video games and RPGs in that sense, but I got into TTRPGs several years ago because my kids got old enough and I'd, I'd learned about it a lot growing up and things, but it was always, you know, for the boys. And um, mm-hmm. and then it seemed a little bit more accessible. At some point I saw a YouTube series, Girls Guts Glory, and I was like, this is amazing. And so I got the starter kit and was like, family game night. And um, I've been a dungeon master ever since. So have you always been a dungeon master or do you get to play as well at times? Or are you I get to play for- like, yeah, people invite me to play in like one shots, a lot of charity one shots and yeah. things like that. Mm-hmm. So I I used to say yes to everything. Now I'm like 50% of the time I say yes, just because <laughs> like, you know, time. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm trying to think, I don't think I've played in any long-term campaign. The longest game mm-hmm. I played in was six weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've never, I've never been a, a player player. Like a, like a, a so. regular ongoing campaign. Yeah, like getting to friends. kind of build up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything like that. No. Yeah. Do you wish that or do you prefer being in the DM control seat and running and, and doing the storytelling part from from that perspective? Or do you would you want to do that for? I don't know. Well, I technically OK, I technically did start one. We're in our second session, but it's a meeting like once a month. It's um, right. my partner is writing a 5e compatible anime oh, uh, cool. kind of setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we're playing that, but we've only had two sessions, but hypothetically that's going to be going on for a while. And I really, really enjoy what I've been able to, it's mm-hmm. only been a few hours of play, but I'm like, oh, I get to really dig into this character. So that is exciting. Yeah. Uh, and it's a lot more relaxing being on the yes. player side of things. You just get <laughs> to sit there and like jump in when you feel like yeah, it. Be immersed and like, oh, it's oh great. Rather than being all everything going. Uh-huh. <laughs> So that's nice. I don't know, though. I really like to talk. So I notice every <laughs> once in a while I'll be playing in a game and I'm like, like my ADHD <laughs> kicks in and I'm like, ah, ah, 
I just want to talk more. <laughs> so like small groups, if I were going to play, would definitely be better. And is there like a particular genre that you like running? I know obviously. Horror. We'll, yeah. <laughs> She's the ancient. I know we're going to get a bit. So it's a purely horror then? or, or do you I like love. Yeah. I love horror. I love with the Feywild as well, that quirkiness, but also. Mm-hmm. So I run a lot of Wild Beyond the Witchlight and I really enjoy mm. the Feywild aesthetically and some of the rules and stuff, but it's also too random for me. Mm. I really struggled getting into Wild Beyond the Witchlight because of the quirky randomness. I apparently, I learned something about myself as a storyteller. <laughs> I need everything to make sense and be yep. connected to other things. <laughs> and I need to fully understand why we're doing something. Not horror. It has yeah. to be like... Even in the, like, I'm writing for this one company and um, these these one shots and I keep, they're like, okay, let's do this. And we want it to be like, you know, your quirky stuff. And I'm like, oh, evil this and people are dying this and there's a mystery <laughs> here. And they're like, mm-mm-mm. No, I'm like, oh, no, 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 that's right. Okay. So, so it's like, it's like a full-time mentality for me. Just like the, the horror true. mystery stuff. No, I, I'm a huge horror fan myself. Like, I just think that you can create so many different sort of degrees of horror. That's not like full on mm-hmm. gorgeous, but like you could have such a, a beautifully written story with just those tints of sort of those little elements of horror. So like for yourself, where did you get your sort of inspiration for the horror stuff? Is it through films? Is it through uh, reading? Like where, where do you get that most of that sort of like, I guess not enjoyment, but like just reading about it or, or knowing about it. Like what got you started into the sort of the horror genre? As a kid, I was really into Tim Burton, mm-hmm. which is probably why my aesthetic as an adult is like cotton candy horror. Um, <laughs> really into Guillermo del Toro. Oh, who's, the, who's the guy that does amazing plot twists? Um, oh, M. Night um, Shyamalan. Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. that was so good. No, I just, I grew up like specifically very into those Mm. movies and then the books I read were all Anne Rice interview with the vampire series um oh goosebumps I grew up on goosebumps I read every single one yes uh so yeah no I from very early on I thought I was going to go into film directing because I was like I want to be a storyteller Mm -hmm. and I just you know did a different kind of storytelling and it's cool but like, those those genres of horror that you picked up like the Tim Burton and the Del Toro and stuff like that, they're all very particular you they have their own sort of brand on it don't they it's, mm-hmm. it's very much like ordinary story but in an extraordinary world and that's mm-hmm. I always love that with D&D or any RPGs is like creating those stories where you there's something not necessarily not right but something that's just extraordinary about the place and getting your players immersed in that is just such a cool feeling and how they deal with it is just yes. such cool things so, no, I know I fully appreciate all those horror things. I'm like, oh yeah. And now I just want to read It's world it. building, right? Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. So for those people who don't know, what is She is the Ancient? And how does it stand out from other sort of horror D&D source books or supplements? So She is the Ancient is, uh, the way, the, the subtitle I gave it is a gender-bent Curse of Strahd mm-hmm. guidebook. So it is not like its own campaign setting or anything. It is a supplement where you still have to have Curse of Strahd. And I recommend you have Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft and things like that. And then you use it to tweak things in Curse of Strahd. And the idea behind it was, well, I mean, there's a whole story behind it, but the whole, I, I started working on it and I didn't realize I could do anything with it. I only learned about like a year and one month ago that DMs Guild existed Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that I was allowed to legally publish and make money on something with official content. I had up until that point just been keeping all my notes and thoughts on how to do this, this supplement and then realized, oh my gosh, I could publish it as well. And so I like wrap my mind around that, but it's not just gender bent. Uh, It takes a lot of the other problems that Curse of Strahd had. Um, There's some seriously like racist issues in it, ableist issues uh, on top of like the the sexism and and whatnot. And so I kind of went through and everything I was uncomfortable with, I put in my own content and ideas for how to run it differently in those aspects. So See, I've been told several times I need to make sure to like fit all of that in the subtitle somehow because people just think that it's just a gender swapped campaign. It's like, no, 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 it's it's like fixing lots of problems. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And it, it is an absolutely cracking read because you not only sort of like, yeah, like you said, it's not just like, oh, we'll just change the gender of the main villain. You go into so much detail in each of the sections and then change really key points of the backstory. 
I'm guessing you ran Curse of Strahd or were about to run it, and then you just like, I want to change your own thing on it. Was that was that the inspiration behind it then? Yeah, I got into D and D, discovered. Oh my gosh, they have whole campaign books. It's not just Lost Mine of Andelver. Wait a minute. <laughs> so I bought it immediately, started reading it, and was like, Oh, oh no, mm. oh no, <laughs> no, I can't run this this way. Like I immediately was like, that's not going to work at Mm -hmm. all. And um, so I started swapping out some of the things that were really problematic. And then I noticed that just all the NPCs, with the exception of like a couple, were men. And I've told a couple other people this story as well, because it's kind of just a ridiculous origin to this thing. Mm -hmm. It was the same time that I had sat down and was like, Princess Bride, one of my Mm -hmm. favorite stories of all time, Mm -hmm. like to illustrate. Yes. Like I just have, I like have every <gasps> edition of the Princess Bride. Oh, that is a gorgeous book. Oh, massively obsessed with everything about it. But was like, oh my gosh, wouldn't this be great if it were gender bent? And so yeah. I started writing a fan fiction where, like, the whole thing is just purely gender bent, and they're all trying to just like save this little man who's like, I don't want to get married. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And so I was like, I want to do the same thing with this story. And the first time I ran it, it was ridiculous. And everybody was like, this is, I can't, these men are pathetic. And I was like, yeah, well, it was pathetic before too, but now you can see it. Like we're, Mm. we're shining a light on it now. And so then I was like, okay, actually, why don't we balance things out and make it like a fun story or not like a fun story, but like a, like a serious switch up Yeah. instead of something that is now just kind of silly. You talk about it in the introduction, this idea that, you know, it comes from, you know, Dracula and, you know, people preying on women and stuff like that. And yet you're right. As soon as we flip it, oh, this doesn't feel real. This doesn't feel realistic. And you're like, it didn't before. So it, it's now very interesting just to go back and like balance it. And what you've done, like you said, not just change genders, but you changed like the age of some of the people in this. You know, you've changed sort of their sort of sexuality and like made people, made characters on the same footing as of. So it's not necessarily this big power dynamic as well, which instantly makes it a more interesting story, a more interesting read, which it actually grips you. It's not about one man's desire for you know, a woman, it's so much more than that. And I just, it's so interesting because Curse of Strahd is the most popular D&D module, right? It, every time you type it into, into YouTube, it comes up as people playing it and people are still playing the story. So you, you wonder at times that like, maybe they just know the story by now. So it's so cool to see such a refreshing look on it. And I really appreciated that as well. And like you said, going through some of the really awful stereotypes that still exist in even in, in the revamped revisions version. And you're like, we don't need those. And I really like that with your book is that you have a page on it going, nope, <laughs> this is why I got rid of it. Nope, don't need it. And it's just, oh, it was so refreshing to read. Just like, yeah, I don't need it. Try this instead. So I guess when you were sort of redesigning or sort of re, yeah, rewriting Curse of Strahd, what was your sort of favorite bit to come up with? Was there a particular bit that you were like, this is one I really want to get across to people? Like, I, I want to really want people to change this part of the story. There are definitely a couple that I was super excited about. And I'm still super excited about. One, changing the very racist terminology of the people in the Abbey of St. Markovia Mm -hmm. to being the patients and being um, basically the broken ones Mm -hmm. concept from the Lamordia content. And I'm super excited about that because my next project is Lamordia. (gasps) And so I was like, oh, we're going to dig in and like, amazing, like start foreshadowing this. And yeah, I was just, I was excited to to change that around mm. the art I, I love the artwork too really cool and then the wine mm, yeah in Barovia. like I was the, it always bugged me that the wine had no actual significance in the story other than oh no the wine is almost gone people are going to be very sad and it's like, <laughs> yeah. what nobody cares mm-hmm. and so I got super excited coming up with the new wine concept mm. uh, and making it much more of a, a serious situation yeah a proper like it affects the whole land and like you said it's not necessarily driven on people's dependency on alcohol which is again another problematic thing as mm-hmm. well so that's really cool and yeah your flip for the patients at the abbey to make it sort of like you described it as a more Frankenstein type thing mm-hmm. instantly you're hitting those Victoriana sort of horror 
horror tropes and everything like that. And it just instantly feels so much more interesting, engaging, especially because that whole thing with the Abbott as well, being introduced to this person as they're just really kind and loving it. They, you know, they heal people, but then dripping the fact that they're not good. And <laughs> that's the best part <clears throat> of any horror thing is like realizing like, oh, damn it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. to get out of here. I was tricked. <laughs> oh, we thought, damn it. I mean, by the time you think, by the time they get there, they might, oh, well, you know, they can't trust anyone. But you think, oh, maybe we can trust us. It's clearly some angelic being. And they're like, no, nope, not trust even here. Anyone. <laughs> oh. And that must be true as well with, the, like you said, the Van Richten's uh, new source book as well. So that must be exciting for that. So, like, what was it about that particular domain of dread that really sort of like drew you to it? I love Frankenstein and <laughs> I love body horror horror particularly Mm -hmm. in ttrpg actually no i love body horror in every meet in every type of media actually (laughs) Mm -hmm. um different from slasher horror i actually dislike slasher completely and totally refuse to watch it or take part in it Mm -hmm. but um body horror i don't know why but it absolutely just fills me with joy and so i was like (laughs) naturally that is the next domain to work on I think because also there's a lot of development that went into Lamordia in previous editions, I feel like there's a solid set of bit of groundwork to bounce off of and, you know, change, obviously, because even just, you know, you're reading through it and it's like, hey, look, it's still sexist. Um, (laughs) Fixing the old stuff and adding on to it, changing things. It just... I love doing fan fiction and things like that. Like one day I will come up with my own perfectly unique story, not inspired by anything else. And I will write from there, but I love just building off of what I'm inspired by. Yeah, absolutely. I think fan fiction is one of the best ways to be creative and to write stuff about no matter whose character it is or what world it is. It just gives you a license to tell stories and tell them how you want them to. And that's, that's a beautiful way to do it. So going back to She's the Engine, what was the most challenging part? Was there any bits that you were like, how do I retrofit this or or, or try it? not fix it? Because that's not what I mean here. But like, to, it was any part of it that you're like, I want to change this, but I'm not sure how, if there was a part. Yeah, so there's some stuff that I'm still unsure I did it right. And I'll probably add some extra stuff into the next edition. I wasn't sure if I should dig into the three fanes of Barovia concept mm-hmm. or leave it alone. And I've actually run that concept differently in almost all of my games. So it felt weird to kind of settle on one thing for the book when I had run even that part differently Mm -hmm. every time, because it just kind of depended on the party and what they were interested in. The Amber Temple as well. Mm -hmm. I I've not had enough opportunity to run it to confidently be able to be like, this is this is all my exact ideas for the Amber Temple, like running Curse of Strahd, I think almost 10 times now. It, it just the opportunities for Amber Temple just sometimes don't, don't present happen, themselves. Don't yeah, it's, just, it's quite isolated itself. So to get there, unless there's like a direct reason to go there, I, I, I think it's very hard. You can't just, oh, by the way, let's do a quick detour on that. So I do think it's quite hard to do that. But yeah, yeah. It's, also, it's also, is it quite high level as well from what I remember? It is high level. It is a meat grinder. It can destroy your campaign in a single <laughs> session. Well, it is <laughs> really intense. I kind of want to sit on that one a little more for the next edition and see what what could be considered or added. It's just one I wasn't confident about. Hmm, that's fair. So just to go back, when you're running games for a younger audience or, or teenagers, like, and now you just said you got back into, well, not, not got back, you started to run campaigns for adults. What's been the difference? You said you've enjoyed both experiences of it. Like what's been the difference for you that you could easily sort of see? Well, and this is from the perspective of paid gaming too, I should preface, because I've, I've run for lots of adults for free previously just like friends and and stuff like that. Uh, From a professional DM standpoint, it's interesting because with kids, their parents are paying me for each session and Mm -hmm. the kids aren't involved in that that part of the process. Mm -hmm. And that changes their, what is, I'm trying to think of the word, their level of, like they're involved. They're very excited. They build their characters. They give me their backstories. They're very into it. Mm -hmm. But they're not as driven to show like, up on time. Or... Right, right. I see. Yes, yeah, I get it. They're, they're sort of, they're engaged, but not like if something comes up, then, oh, well, they go do that thing. Is yeah, that... like I've had, I've had kids that get, um, they'll be like, oh, I'm playing, I, I have a Minecraft game with friends at the same time and things like that. And I'm like, oh, okay, no, we're focusing if we're here and a respect for everyone kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas adults are like, they're paying with their own money. And so they're like, 
I am here. I am focused. I am <laughs> like they're doing artwork between sessions and yeah. chatting in the discord. And like, there's just this level of involvement. And also because I can connect with adults legally more so outside of sessions and things like that. Um, I've built strong friendships mm. with my adult players and that's also really interesting for mm-hmm. gameplay and things like that. So yeah, no, I, I, I'm enjoying it so yeah. much mm. and yeah, it's, it's, there's a little bit more anxiety about running for adults because I feel okay. like I, I know this is incorrect. I know this is wrong, but I feel like adults know more about everything. And so I'm going to be judged more easily on small mistakes and things. Oh, interesting. I find that really right? interesting. Hmm. Like yeah, a I kid's can... not going to care if I mess up the story a little bit, or if mm. I'm like, if I, I stumble over things, they're going to be like, ah, I'm playing D D, or an adult's going to be like, this is what I paid for. You know what I mean? Absolutely. But I know that's not the case. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, cause I've had something similar recently. Cause I was, I was uh, running games at a convention uh, recently and I was, I was very nervous because again, you know, first time back from pandemic and running stuff and um, all of them were adults, but the, it was interesting. The age was, was a difference. So the younger uh, adults there, like, you know, early twenties and stuff, they were like really excited, really, it was more improv And then the more serious ones, I, I generally thought I'd lost them at one point. So there was that anxiety going, I've made a mistake. But then afterwards, I, there was one person who I could just tell was just so like engaged with it didn't really care that there was a mistake or two the thing they were just like what do we do next okay we're gonna you know and then was really pushing the story along so i guess from my experience as sort of dming for conventions and stuff is that as long as people are like like you said that engagement in the game like okay i'm here now i'm present all right there's this i'll clarify it but it doesn't matter like it's not a life or death situation i guess i don't know but it's i i was i too had that sort of real nervous like oh i've mucked up and then that means they're not going to get this or they're not going to get that but then if you're transparent about it at the end or if they clarify it then it's actually easier but it's so that's so cool about the the whole making friendships and that that trust thing like with adults because it's just it's very hard to do that nowadays it's very hard to actually go out right and make friends like i don't know how people do it and like in the before times it's just (laughs) (laughs) well until like add on to what you were saying about like newer players being really enthusiastic and like the um that is another big thing when you're running for adults adults already have an established style of gameplay that they like mm. when i'm running for kids i've just taught them how to play D. so whatever i do they're like this is D. Mm. they haven't been like oh i need virtual tabletops i need tokens i need mm. only theater of the mind i need music in the back like they haven't developed these things that are like why aren't you doing this or that but with adults you have to be like okay this is how i run my games if you don't like that you might not like it here <laughs> kind uh, of thing yeah no that, that's fair I, I find that's, that's really interesting i guess maybe, maybe for me because i've done just all stuff online and i just can't be bothered with virtual tabletop do you use that then quite a bit yourself do you use minis and stuff like that or do you, are you just like sob that <laughs> i pull out my plate. <laughs> virtual tabletops when i have to i I have tried to use roll 20 three different times and my brain cannot wrap around how it functions. And so I just, I straight, (laughs) I just quit, quit. I quit, quit it. I actually, so my virtual tabletop Mm -hmm. is I, I only pull them out during intricate battles or when somebody has specifically requested it or I have like really cool art. I want to like use for the map. And then I just pull it up in, in a visual designer program on my end and screen share and control the tokens. Like there's no, nobody has to log in anything. All you have to do is show up on the zoom and then I I will give you the visual if we need it. But otherwise I, I just haven't been able to get into them. It there's too much art, the games I run, there's too much improv involved because Mm. I end up going so far off of the books for each group because I say yes. And to damn near everything. Mm -hmm. So it's like, there's no way I could, unless it's a very specific battle we know is going to happen. There's no way I could have virtual stuff ready for everything everything to go. And yeah, because you don't want to add more time for that. I'm guessing you've done most of your games online that if you were doing stuff like that. So yeah, so instantly the more barriers to it, the less interested people are going to be because you've already got people on phones and all that sort of thing but it's so true like i feel like you need to have an additional person who's just purely tech <laughs> to do all like the virtual tabletop stuff because you you are in charge of story that's it <laughs> like sod that mm-hmm. that's all you need to do but i don't know like i understand i'm just like we're going to use 
appears with the mind or at best like maybe a shared powerpoint <laughs> and then we can just move it all ourselves and so everyone gets on it and that's it that's as, um, as much as my uh my tech goes because i can't go with these uh virtual tabletops myself either <laughs> so like you were saying she's the ancient got platinum bestseller on dm skill very recently so congratulations for that and there's been Thank talk you. it's yeah it's so exciting because that's such a rare thing to happen with dm skills titles so and you've mentioned uh that you are doing a, a version do an, an update soon is there anything that you're particularly focusing on or is there anything we can expect from the next update or is it still well off in the works and you just want to keep it to yourself for now it's not going to be like a massive amount of updates it's going to be a few additions and because the last one was so rushed i i did i did run it through an editor mm-hmm. um but i'm going to go through and do editing grammar and spelling and um little mistakes that have been thoroughly pointed out to me by some um you know people in my inbox <laughs> oh how wonderful how kind right. of them to do that oh, thank thanks so you. much <laughs> okay to be fair one of the emails was like i actually love it i'm just trying to be helpful i was like thank you yeah that's different that's different constructive is better than uh-huh. <laughs> actual criticism so yes, yes. i get that <laughs> so i'm gonna fix those first yeah. of all i uh licensed some more artwork to add to it and oh. i also have hired a few writers to oh, add little like exciting. like 500 to 2000 word kind of articles to add in oh, cool. um one for example um my partner is doing a more in-depth write-up on ez because i didn't really get to touch on him very much in it because he's, he's like just not an npc i typically run a lot so i was like oh here's what i have done and so he's like we're doing a whole thing and do the oh, backstory we're cool. getting custom art yeah all that stuff so uh, yeah no that, that's very cool because yeah as could become a very important npc but like you said if you're if you if you don't run them that much then you know it's just that's that's where you're focusing so that's really cool that you're expanding out onto with different yeah stuff. that's really cool so yeah there's going to be some more voices in it and there's one i'm so excited about but i cannot spoil it it is ridiculous nope. <laughs> so good um but yeah so the whole reason for the update in general is because now that it's platinum and it was my first dms guild publication it can it is now eligible for going to print yes. and so i'm like let's fix things before people have it you know physically in front of them and i can't just edit it and update it <laughs> and send it to them again you know so yeah so once those articles are all into me and the new custom artwork is finished and i'm just gonna pop them into layout get my cmyk with bleeds all figured out <laughs> and I'm hoping it'll be ready for hardcover by August. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah, that, yeah that's, yeah. that's a months away. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I will definitely be ordering that then. Because yeah, like I said, I, I've mentioned on this podcast before, but I appreciate like, this is the first time we're actually talking. I started running Curse Strad and it was a gender bent one before I found your stuff. And we're now on a hiatus for like the last couple of months. When we come back to it, I'm like, we're going to have to restart because I just want to <laughs> take <laughs> your wonderful book and go, no, all my ideas were no, rubbish because I it was these, these ones instead. So I to have a physical copy of that in front of me will be amazing to win. Hopefully we'll do it around the table again. So that that's my dream for winner. So I'm like, excellent. Version two is in the works. I can't wait. <laughs> so with uh, you talked before about A Wild Beyond the Witch Light, obviously you've run that a few times as well. Are there any other published adventures or any other adventures that you know of with from Wizards or, or any other DM thing that you think, oh, I'd love to do a, a gender bent version of that or would like to like have some sort of redesign or reworking of that at all? That is a good question. I'm such a hyper focuser that I'm like, <laughs> have I? Have I considered other ones? I don't know if I've considered any for like official content because a lot of the official content is very like high fantasy based, which has never mm. floated my boat anyway. So I haven't mm. even bothered with most of it. Mm-hmm. We just talked playing with the idea the other day of Vecna stuff, but I don't, I, I don't know. It's not quite sparking interest. Yeah, it's, um, not, it's not sparking joy. So yeah, Lamoria has already been gender bent, so that's easy. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of like not D and D stuff I want to yeah. do. Um, yeah, well, what, what kind of kind if you'd like to share, please. As far as gender bending or in general? <laughs> in general, in general. I, I, I want to hear about all your stuff. <laughs> I want to do a whole, like, I want to do goosebumps inspired one shots. Oh, I want to yes. do like 
winter horror stuff. I want to um, I want to go through all of Ravenloft stuff and mm. just make supplements for all of it, mm-hmm. um, which that should all keep me actually pretty busy for a while. Uh, yeah, that's, that is uh, all the horror. <laughs> I get to have a whole section of um, my partner's world for because he's got that anime uh, inspired Kickstarter coming mm-hmm. up. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I get to have like a section in that and I'm going to like Ghibli universe the <gasps> hell out of it. And I'm yes. really excited about that. That's cool. Uh, just, just loads uh, to tick you over really. TV show based on gender bending that I really want to do at some point next mm. year. Yeah. Where we take all the old, really sexist games and we just gender swap them. Just, just gender swap. So we've got like, you know, you arrive to the beach and they're okay. For example, mm-hmm. the entire quest hook of a campaign I read yesterday from second edition mm-hmm. is you get to the beach and there is a lithe woman with long golden hair and she looks at you with her rosy lips and she flips her hair and runs the other direction. And that's <laughs> supposed to be your quest hook. That's what gets you into the completely unrelated story. Amazing. <laughs> and I was like, imagine, just imagine that being a dude. Yeah, you, know, you got your Fabio on the beach, and it, it, so I was like, a TV show idea that I would love to run at some point is an all female cast mm-hmm. where we're all in on the joke. Yes, and we run these these one shots as written, with the exception of just gender bending. Yeah, and they have to like go and save these damsels in distress and things like that. And then I was like, but I feel like everybody's going to have equal opportunity, like titty tassel armor, you know, and it's like somehow magically connected your, your nipple coverings do protect your belly. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds fucking hilarious. I love that. And you know, it's so true. I I've been, we, in a previous episode, we looked at the original like ruins of under mountain and one of the quest hooks to get into under mountain, in is that you're walking down a street, a, a lady of the night in quotation marks goes for the most charming or most beautiful male character. And it's like then you're like, why? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and obviously, and then there's a distraction and they get they go get like all poison dart and sleep, and then they they get taken away somewhere. But you just think to yourself, gross. <laughs> like I don't want to play <laughs> because then I'll be like, oh, it's going to be me or it's going to be me. And you're like, no, don't. Yeah. So there's going to be ways of us changing that language, changing that narrative. So it's something completely different, but it just, it just made me laugh. I was like the most charismatic, almost handsome male character. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess one of the sort of penultimate questions is uh, what would your main advice be for anybody who plans to run Curse of Strahd with She is the Ancient sort of uh, helping out, supplementing or changing sort of parts of the story? What would be your main advice for that? Oh no. If any. Oh no. If any. <laughs> I think my main advice would be you still got to read the whole book of Curse of Strahd. Yeah. I've had that question a lot. They're like, do I need the original at all now? I'm like, technically, yeah. Like, I feel like I could get in trouble if you didn't. <laughs> like, it, it, feels it, like, it makes more sense for sure. Cause, uh, cause you, you can map it, but it's very easy to map places. So you can like jump chapter to chapter. So I definitely say that. Yeah. Yeah. So I would, I would still read the original and then, um, what uh, <laughs> advice? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, or, or any, any of your sort of top tips for DMing in general, cause you're a professional DM. Use the visuals, have them handy. Okay. So one thing, one thing, since yeah. I made the book and I have the visuals for all the NPCs. Now, mm. when I introduce an NPC, I screen share the picture of them. And there is always a visceral reaction. People yes. love them a lot. Apparently, uh, the joke is that when a bisexual makes um, portraits of NPCs, they're just, they're all hot. <laughs> so hot. So, Amazing. <laughs> so um, share those. Mm-hmm. Uh, very recommended. James RPG Art on Pinterest. Ha- um, he makes tons of scenery artwork for Curse of Strahd, and I licensed all of his work to use in the book. I would go, I think it only costs a couple dollars to subscribe to his Patreon and then, you know, show those scenes whenever you're in those areas as well, kind of screen share those. And then I use I did, I was using Sirenscape for background music for a while because mm-hmm. it got a bunch of Curse of Strahd tracks, but it was a lot to manage. Um, mm-hmm. I have I have trouble with focus already. And so I actually just use YouTube now and paid for premium. So we weren't getting commercials in the middle of games. <laughs> but um, I just literally type in like D&D horror music and there's one that's three hours that pops up and I use it for every game now. And it sets such a good mood 
for yeah. She is the Ancient. So highly recommend that. I, I completely agree with the visual stuff as well. It's it's like you said, it's because sometimes when you describe an NPC or a place, you know, big descriptions and big flavor stuff is like, it's great. But like sometimes as a player, I really struggle to like visualize stuff. So having mm-hmm. stuff like that, like that's so cool. Like I agree. Every NPC that you've got and she's the ancient, you're like, oh, yes, they are very beautiful. But also I now can visualize that for talking to that person and who that person is. And another great thing that you've done with she's the ancient as well, you have the mannerisms and like how you have portrayed this NPC, but like suggestions about what else they could do uh, based on the backstory that you've given them, which is great. As a result, but yeah, I love I, all those NPC portraits are like beautiful. So I completely <laughs> agree with that because I'm like, yeah, I'm going to share those. Like, you, you don't keep that to yourself as a DM. You're like, no, you guys need to see. You need to see who you're <laughs> like you've got to. the content, you've got it right there. Use it. Mm-hmm. Throw it into your game. They're going to love it. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, with the soundscape. So I, I agree. I, I again. When you're a storyteller, it's very hard to like do tech stuff as well. Like I, I'd even give it to another player for that. But yeah, D and D horoscopes on YouTube. There's so many as well. I love, but I love the advice of like pay for premium or something because you don't want <laughs> you don't want your Spotify ads to suddenly appear up or like Domino's like whatever. You're like, oh, Strahd. Like, We're having a very like... serious moment, and then it's like, did you know with Grammarly Premium, it's like, I'm so sorry, guys. Hold on. <laughs> I would love that though. Depending on the ads that you get in, that would be so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Penultimate question to you then is that what plans have you got for the future? Do you have any other projects in the works? Obviously, I know we've talked about a few of them just now, but is anything else? that you'd like to share that or you're that you're able to share without sort of like any ndas or anything. everything yeah sure. i can't share the nda stuff Obviously. unfortunately because it's like fun stuff i feel like i can share one thing though so i i i can share that i write for dungeon in a box mm-hmm. and that sometime in the next two or three months <gasps> one of the boxes will be one of my one shots oh and that's so is- exciting very inspired by mystery, horror, and fey kind of stuff. It's gonna be really cool. <laughs> that is so cool. Oh, that's so, that those that, yeah, Dungeon in the Box is such a cool subscription service and everything like that. So oh amazing. Yeah. Work. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I'll be I'll definitely be shouting from the rooftops when that one is. I, I can't remember what month mine is. And then I really I think I'm just gonna live in Ravenloft for a while. I'm still I'm getting so much dopamine off of it that mm it's going to be hard to focus on anything else for a while. So I'm like, I'm just going to keep riding this Ravenloft stuff. I finally figured out how to kind of manage a team for building a book rather than having to build a book entirely by myself like I did the last hey, time. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Lamordia, um, it's going to be called Snow and Stitched Flesh. It's the plan is to have it out in September so that, you know, that kind of Halloween excitement of October, Mm -hmm. um, people can go ahead and start running it if they want to. It's it's really coming together. I'm super excited about it, but I'm also excited to finish it so I can go on to the next one. Yes, that I'm excited about. (laughs) (laughs) And then I'm hoping to put something out by Christmas, like like a like a holiday something or other. But I only started talking about that one in the last week and putting it together but i'm also like if i could write she is the ancient in a month i feel like i can put out something for the holidays too see that's, that's, okay. that's, <laughs> like, that's like you're like well what else have you got you got your dming in general you're going this this and this so yeah you, you can easily put that on top <laughs> of like all the other cool stuff you're doing <laughs> it's it's really chaotic over here i'm not gonna lie but i don't know how to stop someone help me stop no, no. If you, as long as you enjoy doing it, it doesn't matter. Uh, so like, much dopamine. Yeah, but also I'm, crying, crying through the dopamine. Okay, <laughs> happy tears. I'll take that as happy tears. That's fine. <laughs> oh, well, Beth, well, thank you so much. It's been such a wonder to, like, just a wonderful experience to talk to you. And like, like I said, I've been reading through She's the Ancient, and I'm just gone every page. I'm like, yes. Why, why, why haven't I just run it like that? So that's why when we restart this Curse of Strahd campaign, I'm just like, yeah. We're starting from scratch, guys. You're, you're outside the dead house. We're going to do it all again. <laughs> no, too bad, too late. Because <laughs> it's going right there. Um, but where can we find you? Where, you know, where can we find follow your work? And and where can we get She is the Ancient? So you can get She is the Ancient at sheistheancient.com. Super easy. Points right to the DMs Guild page. And then my personal website is bettthebar.com. Desperately need some updating, but it's going to be getting a huge revamp in the next few weeks. So that'll be exciting. And then um, my socials are all at it's Beth the Bard, <laughs> like on everything, just Twitter. I'm all, I'm always on Twitter. 
Well, Brilliant, thank you so much, Beth. This has been absolutely wonderful to talk to you about this. Thanks for having me. 